The Security Council is met here today under the shadow of the terrible news. As a potent weapon in the keen ideological warfare. The Soviet member or anyone else on the commission may of course appeal against this ruling. This universal declaration of human rights may well become the international Magna Carta of all men everywhere. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Simple, timeless words. These words were intended to be the gold standard for measuring humanity's common standard of achievement. These were the words of the first article of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The Declaration was adopted by the General Assembly of the United Nations on the 10th of December 1948. But getting world leaders to agree to these principles was not so simple. It was a challenge then, but would be an even bigger challenge today. This is the little-known story of the complex negotiations that took place over three years to draft the declaration we have before us today. By the time the document saw the light of day, close to 250 delegates from 56 countries had been involved in writing and rewriting it. People of great nations and small, whose delegations meet here. And symbolically, all flags are of equal size. Provoked by the horrors of the Second World War, world leaders looked at human rights as a way or even as an external tool to facilitate in building a peaceful and stable world order. Price of aggressive war could be seen in the heart of Nazi Germany. Once the proud capital of Middle Europe, Berlin lay in ruins. When Britain, the United States, and the Soviet Union, known as the Big Three, met near Yalta to discuss the reorganization of Europe in the aftermath of World War II, their early proposals for the United Nations contained only one small reference to human rights. U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt died in April 1945. His widow, Eleanor Roosevelt, was his distant cousin. In the cabinet room of the White House, Harry S. Truman was sworn in as president. The San Francisco UN conference began that month. The major outcome of the conference was the UN Charter. Unlike the League of Nations that preceded it, the discussions involved in drafting the Charter included strong arguments around the value of human rights. Conference of the United Nations on International Organization is now convened. The conference lasted two months. Many states suggested that human rights be included in the provisions of the UN Charter. Cuba and Panama were among the staunchest defenders of human rights. Thanks to the efforts of smaller states and non-governmental organizations, seven references to human rights were finally incorporated into the Charter. Under the United Nations Economic and Social Council, a Commission on Human Rights was established. To launch a rule of law and a bill of human rights upon the earth, the Commission was tasked with creating a new kind of International Bill of Rights. 
In December 1945, President Truman asks Eleanor Roosevelt to accept an appointment as a United States delegate to the United Nations. The first ever session of the UN General Assembly was held in London in January 1946. Cuba asked that the agenda include an item on a declaration of the international duties and rights of man. Cuba's representative was Professor Ernesto de Higo, a prominent diplomat and legal expert. He told the assembly, we need to tell the world that we have not forgotten the promises that were made in San Francisco. But he was voted down. Down, but not out. The Cuban delegation went straight to the Commission on Human Rights with a draft declaration. It was April 1946 in New York where the Nuclear Commission on Human Rights met for the first time. At Hunter College, the Assistant Secretary General for Social Affairs was French scientist Henri Laguerre. His request to the Commission was direct. You will have to look for a basis for a fundamental declaration on human rights acceptable to all the United Nations. Two drafts were under consideration, one from Cuba and the other from Panama. The Panamanian proposal was drafted by Dr. Ricardo Alfaro, an expert in international law and former president of Panama. The Commission spent most of 1946 brainstorming the best way forward. The debate resumed in the General Assembly in January 1947. Dr. Ricardo, the representative of Panama, made an eloquent defense of the draft that he had submitted earlier. He asked the General Assembly to adopt it, but Eleanor Roosevelt, as the chair of the Human Rights Nuclear Commission, referred the matter back to her committee. The draft was sent back to the United Nations, temporarily housed in Lake Success, New York. Eighteen diplomats from the Commission on Human Rights held their meetings in January and February of 1947. The Commission included prominent figures in international diplomacy. Eleanor Roosevelt represented the United States and chaired the Commission. Dr. René Cassin, a legal scholar, represented France. Dr. Peng Chung Chang represented China and was the vice chairman of the commission. Dr. Charles Malik represented Lebanon and was the commission's rapporteur. And John Humphrey, a Canadian legal scholar, was the secretary of the commission. During the debates, a trend was appearing. The United States wanted a non-binding resolution to be passed in the General Assembly. But other countries, led by India, wanted a binding one. To break the stalemate, a drafting committee was created. It included Eleanor Roosevelt, Pen Chung Chang, Charles Malik, and John Humphrey. They were tasked with writing the first draft of the bill. Early on, it became apparent that Chang and Malik could not work together. Both were intellectual diplomats with an academic background, but they were too far apart in their philosophical approaches. It therefore came down to the Canadian, John Humphrey, to prepare the draft. At the Economic and Social Council held in March and April of 1947, many countries were displeased by the composition of the drafting committee. They argued that it was too small and lacked geographic representation. As a result, the committee was expanded to include eight countries, Australia, China, Chile, France, Lebanon, United States, United Kingdom, and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. The Council also recommended that the bill be submitted to the General Assembly in 1948. A deadline was set. <laughs> Away from the hustle and bustle of New York City, Humphrey sequestered himself for a week at the Lido Beach Hotel in Long Island, New York. The outcome was a draft with close to 400 pages of annexes. Humphrey considered the proposals submitted by five countries, Cuba, Panama, Chile, India, and the United States. Before that, the Secretariat had commissioned a study of 50 national constitutions, 18 from Europe, 18 from Latin America, 
10 from Asia, and 4 from Africa. The draft outline that emerged in June 1947 consisted of a preamble and 48 articles. The newly expanded drafting committee met for the first time on the 9th of June 1947 in New York. Humphrey's draft framed the debate. It mirrored a common understanding of politicians at the time of the crucial link between human rights and peace. Despite all the subsequent changes that were made to Humphrey's draft, that essence never left the Declaration. The movies will not bother you for more than 10 minutes. They are for documentation purposes. And um, while I think they're most uh, trying as far as the lights go, it will not be for long. This documentary is made possible thanks to the few recordings taken during that time. Eleanor Roosevelt presided over the full commission. Almost no one expected the magnitude of the historical legacy this committee would leave behind. She is assigned the chairmanship of the apparently unimportant Committee 3, dealing with a broad area of human rights. Most history books consider her to be the real hero of the Declaration of Human Rights. Eleanor Roosevelt is the driving force behind the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But that is an oversimplification. Her role is both overstated and underappreciated. Her genius lay in her grasp of the political maneuvering required to win. In the critical early phases of the project, she steered the debate and moved the process along. Eleanor Roosevelt, however, did not write any version of the Declaration. Due to American social norms at the time, she was listed in some UN documents as Mrs. Franklin D. Roosevelt, which today would be inappropriate. Every line in the draft was debated endlessly and disagreements abounded. Article 3 of Humphrey's draft, everyone has the right to life, proved to be a critical point for the committee. The delegate from Chile, Honorable Mr. Santa Cruz, Chile's delegate, Judge Hernán Santa Cruz, argued for recognizing the life of any human born or unborn. Eleanor Roosevelt suggested that the document avoid the use of the phrase death penalty, as this was a legal form of punishment in some states. The Soviet delegate, Alexander Bogomolov, replied the UN should not in any way signify approval of the death penalty, arguing that it had been abolished in his country. The rising tensions between the Soviet Union and the United States at the start of the Cold War were felt inside the drafting room. It is my ruling as chairman of the commission that the point raised by the Soviet member is out of order. The Soviet member or anyone else on the commission may of course appeal against this ruling. If anyone does appeal against the ruling, I will immediately submit the ruling to the vote. During the drafting phase, a substantial amount of time and energy were spent on procedural matters. Even when the wording of the articles was negotiated, everything was put to a vote. The drafting committee established a temporary working group to rearrange Humphrey's draft in light of the discussion that took place that week. French delegate Cassin worked on the text for a few days. This produced what is now known as the Cassin Draft, which is at times described as the original version of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The Cassin Draft, according to a study by Harvard Law professor Mary Ann Glendon, preserved most of the substantive content of the initial draft by Humphrey. Cassin's draft consisted of a preamble and 42 articles. After more discussions, the committee reduced Cassin's text to 36 articles. On June 25, 1947, the first session of the drafting committee ended. Although the committee members' views were not unanimous, alternatives were sought out. The result was a working paper for a preliminary draft. The text initially used the expression, all men, generically. Humphrey, Casson, Roosevelt, and other drafting committee members did not object to the wording. But the diplomat Hansa Mehta of India, a freedom fighter and writer who followed Gandhi's teachings, did object. Mehta was an active member of the UN Commission on the Status of Women, 
She insisted that the word men should not be taken for granted as inclusive of women. Thanks to Hansa Maida's persistence, the text was changed to All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. The second session of the Commission on Human Rights convened in Geneva in December 1947. At that time, it was clear that the International Bill of Human Rights was not a single, all-encompassing document, and that the task of drafting it was going to lead to two or three separate documents. The drafting room was no longer occupied by a committee of eight members. It had swelled to 18 diplomats and 30 experts from non-governmental bodies, they were meeting daily for two straight weeks. Talks were ongoing about what direction and form the final bill would take, until a clear proposal came from Belgium. Politician and academic Bernard de Hus proposed that the bill be divided into three working groups. First would be the declaration. Another team would work on the convention, and the last would work on implementation the committee adopted the Belgian proposal. By the end of 1947, the drafting committee had produced a list of options rather than one polished document. Many provisions were accompanied by explanations. It was time for action. The Geneva text was thorough enough to be sent by the Secretary General of the United Nations to all governments. States were requested to submit their comments by April 1948. In May and June of 1948, the drafting committee reconvened again in New York. The debates were documented down to the last detail. In today's UN, states present their views, but the details are much less visible. On June 1948, the Commission on Human Rights adopted the final draft of the Declaration. Then it was time to submit the draft to the Economic and Social Council, which was holding its seventh session. But things were not looking good. The Council voted to send the draft to the General Assembly, with several reservations. The draft was imperfect. It wasn't sufficiently universal. Its language wasn't precise enough. And maybe more time should be allocated in order to produce a better draft. That summer, the priorities of the United Nations, including the Security Council, were focused on Palestine and elsewhere. The mediator of the United Nations in Palestine, Swedish Count Folk Bernadotte, had stated clearly that Palestinian refugees should be allowed to return to their homes, and that Jerusalem should be a city under international control. Zionist terrorists killed Bernadotte in Jerusalem later that year, in September 1948. The coffins of Count Bernadotte and Colonel Serro, the United Nations observer who was murdered while driving with the mediator, pass on their way from the YMCA building in Jerusalem. The news of the assassination had profoundly shocked all the civilized world. The cortege proceeded to Haifa. From there, the mortal remains of the Count and the Colonel were being taken home to Sweden and to France for burial. Security Council is met here today under the shadow of the terrible news from Palestine of the murder of the United Nations mediator, Count Bernadotte. Bernadotte's statue still stands at the UN headquarters in New York, a memorial for a man who died trying to apply human rights in Palestine. The Third Committee on Human Rights began its work here at the Palais de Chaillot, located directly across the Seine River and the Eiffel Tower in Paris. In September 1948, the final act was beginning. The United States wanted to move fast and resubmit a final draft within a few days. But Charles Malik from Lebanon, who chaired the Third Committee's sessions from late September to early December 1948, told the U.S. delegation that 
Many states wanted a full re-examination of the draft in detail. For more than two months, therefore, 85 meetings were held for discussions, two to three meetings a day, in addition to 20 meetings by subcommittees. In debating Article 16, Saudi Arabia tried to change the provisions for marriageable age from the term full age to illegal marriageable age. Pakistani diplomat and author Dr. Shaista Sohardi Irkamullah resisted, arguing that the original language more clearly conveyed the intent to prevent child marriages and non-consensual marriages. Those two months witnessed some of the richest and most genuine debates on human rights ever. Dozens of diplomats and experts contributed to the crafting of the final version that we have today. In the process, its name changed from the International Declaration to the Universal Declaration. On December 7th of that year, the final text of the Declaration was adopted by the Third Drafting Committee. On December 9th, 1948, the General Assembly met at the Palais de Chaillot in Paris. The goal was to discuss the report submitted by the Human Rights Commission. The report consisted of five parts, a draft Universal Declaration of Human Rights and four draft resolutions connected to the Declaration. Over four meetings held between the 9th and 10th of December, the delegates deliberated over the draft using simultaneous translation. The 29 articles in the final draft became 31 articles, but then Article 3 was removed, so the final version of the Declaration consisted of a preamble and 30 articles. De ahora en adelante, todos los seres humanos sabrán que el patrimonio de sus derechos esenciales tiene significados específicos y definidos. Sabrán a ciencia cierta, sin equívoco posible, en qué consisten la dignidad y los derechos que tienen en igualdad desde su nacimiento. Not every man, nor every government, can have what he wants in a document of this kind. There are, of course, particular provisions in the Declaration before us with which we are not fully satisfied. I have no doubt this is true of other delegations. And it would still be true if we continued our labors over many years. J'ai l'honneur d'apporter la ferme adhésion de la France à cet acte historique qui, cent ans après la révolution de 48 et l'abolition de l'esclavage sur toutes les terres françaises, constitue une étape mondiale dans le long combat pour les droits de l'homme. While history alone can determine the historic significance of an event, it is safe to say that the declaration before us may be destined to occupy an honorable place in the procession of positive landmarks in human history. The declaration was not immediately voted on as a full document. Instead, each article was put to a vote one by one. There was also a separate vote on each of the seven recitals of the preamble. Then on December 10th, the declaration as a whole was put to vote. I put the proposal to adopt as a whole the draft Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which paragraph by paragraph, article by article, has been adopted. In favor of adoption, 48. Against adoption, none. Abstentions, eight. The Soviet Union and five countries in its bloc abstained, as did South Africa and Saudi Arabia. The adoption of the declaration with such a huge majority without any serious opposition was a remarkable achievement, and the media knew this was a historic moment. The news went viral. 
By radio and shortwave, the news goes out. Millions of people, men and women and children, all over the world, many miles from Paris and New York, will turn for hope and guidance and inspiration to this document. And although this is only a first step, as speakers have pointed out, it simply declares rights. It doesn't provide by international convention for states being bound to carry out and give effect to those rights. It would take almost 20 years to conclude that work with the completion of the two international covenants on human rights. Implementation of the covenants took yet another decade. Since 1950, the 10th of December has been recognized as Human Rights Day. In 1950, the UN headquarters in New York was still under construction. The Declaration never had a single author at any stage of its drafting. Its great strength lies in the collective nature of its authorship. Today, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is one of the most translated texts in the world, available in more than 500 languages. It took more than a thousand days to draft the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It was built on the old wisdom, an injury to one is an injury to all. Its legacy is one that can be rightfully claimed by all mankind. Today, the impact of this historic document lays in our hands. Are we committed to its values? Do we stand up for human rights in all times and in all places?